Hello there, I'm Kaz. Watching like Final Fantasy and Dragon Quest, the Megami Tensei franchise encompasses many spin-offs. Of these subseries, only one of them has become so popular that they turn into its own franchise, one which is even more well-known and respected than the series of which it first branched off from. This defiant series is known as Persona. In 1996, Atlas released a little title on the original PlayStation called Revelations Persona. Though it wasn't the first Megami Tensei spin-off, nor was it the first to reach North American shores as Jack Brothers predated, Persona was a unique entry in the franchise due to its focus on characterization and shoot for monster recruiting to gathering cards for the purpose of creating the titular Persona. From a time of beginnings on Sony's first console, the series would see more than its fair share of radical shifts in design, with the third title taking cues from dating sim games and adding a calendar system. Unlike most RPG series whose popularity has its peaks and dwindles, the Persona series has only gotten more popular with each new release, so popular in fact that it began receiving its own spin-offs. Yep spin-offs of a series that is itself a spin-off of the Megami Tensei franchise. The first of these, Persona 4 Arena, abandoned the RPG genre in favor of trying its hand in competitive fighting. This time around, the Persona studio is bringing the series back to its RPG root with Persona Q Shadow of the Labyrinth. This is actually one of the earliest announced 3DS games, as early as E3 2010. Details about it were scarce until its revelation alongside Persona 5 and… whatever the heck this is supposed to be. Anyway, is Persona Q an adorable tribute to this beloved series? Or does this spin off, uh. spin off in the wrong direction? Let's find out. The story is. Wait, wait. Is that Philemon? Er, anyway, the story actually has two different paths. Well, I say different. Really, it's more a matter of choosing between the two different leads and the opening scene. Regardless of your choice, the major events in the plot remain the same, with minor changes depending on the version you choose. Since I picked the Persona 3 route, and I am not devoting 60 more hours to play the same story twice, that's the one we're taking a look at in this review. The game opens up with our hero talking with Elizabeth in the Velvet Room while Igor is away. All of a sudden, the rest of the C's team appears in the room which then crashes, with everyone at home, yet manages to arrive at the culture festival at Yasugami High. It's here where they meet Rei and Zen, two amnesiacs attending the school, and discover the two mysterious locked doors have appeared in the Velvet Room. With no other possible way home, the C's team searches for a way to open these doors and return to their school, all while meeting up with the investigation team from Persona 4. The story itself is not very good. It's largely inconsequential to the characters both old and new, and very little actually happens despite its epic length. What events do occur aren't explained very well or quickly forgotten about as the story jumps from one plot point to the next. There's a late game plot twist which is incredibly predictable given the Anesia subplot and setting, and the execution of said twist makes no sense when you stop and think about it. I won't spoil it, but it's something that one simply needs to think about for 5 minutes to reveal how contrived the writing happens to be that said reveal needed to take place in order to raise any sort of stake in the story. It's so inconsequential that the game opens up telling you that everything already happened and you got out just fine. In fairness, it's not without its fine points. It is fun to see the game poke fun of its cliché characters and sillier moments, like Marie's terrible poetry. In fact, the humor is one of the most amusing parts of the entire experience. The writing comes across as a tad fanfiction-y, but at the very least, it's self-aware fanfiction, and you can tell the writers were having fun while writing it. Seeing the two casts interact with each other is delightful to see, even if the characters are boiled down to their basics without any sort of development or depth to them. The new characters are a mixed bunch. Though Rhea is the skinny girl who eats a lot trope, she is an enjoyable and adorable addition to the cast. Sin, on the other hand, is a mopey brooding bore, not helped by his largely monotone voice actor. I am not. Nothing scares me. I must not fear. Fear is the mind killer. Fear is the crawling chaos that brings total obliteration. Speaking of voices, a golden opportunity for comedy is missed at the expense of our two silent leads. Sort of. It depends on the path you choose, but only one of the two leads will actually be silent. The other one talks throughout the entire game. It also doesn't help that they heavily advertise the character interaction between the two casts and the main lead, yet there isn't any character to interact with them, just a blank slate without any defining traits. Oh, and while we're speaking about the advertisements, this? Yeah, this never happens in the entire game. Well, outside of a boss battle with Elizabeth, but I'm getting off track. This is a game about interactions between the two casts, and yet the two main leads can't interact with each other outside of dialogue choices? Never mind the fact that these choices don't actually serve a purpose in forming a character, they limit the amount of development that can be made with the rest of the characters. It's like when they made Maya a silent protagonist in Eternal Punishment, though it's nowhere near as bad as it is there. It still makes such little sense concerning all the other materials that develop these characters, like the Persona 4 Arena series, and yes, this game is in canon to the event that happened in Persona 3, 4, and the Arena games. It doesn't do a good job of explaining it, but it does happen between Persona 3 and 4. The point is that, given how Atlas has and continues to handle the series, the inclusion of the silent protagonist is detrimental to the overall experience and storytelling therein. 
One last thing, many people have been claiming that this is a love letter to Persona fans. Yeah, it's not. The focus on the story is on the cast and characters from Persona 3 and 4, not the entirety of the series. There were some allusions to the pre-Persona 3 era, namely with that massive twist in a certain game mechanic, but there's nothing explicitly referencing it or paying homage to it. That said, as a fan of the older Persona games, it's hard to say that it's disappointing. After all, the main games rarely, if ever, touch upon the pre-Persona 3 era and the events that transpired in it, let alone involve any of the characters. For what it is, it's a cute, albeit pointless, little meeting between the two casts from two much better plots. Any game that suggests Teddy should be roasted alive gets a thumbs up from me. It's gameplay on the other hand. Those familiar with the more recent Persona titles will be quite surprised with Persona Q in more ways than one. Unlike every entry since Revelation to Persona, Q returns the series to its first person dungeon crawling roots as you grind your way through the game's five titular labyrinths. It's a great idea, in concept. As mentioned earlier, while Persona did become more popular with each succeeding entry, it started off more as a niche JRPG before Final Fantasy VII brought the genre into the mainstream. In fact, the sequel, well, one of the sequels in the Persona 2 duology, Innocent Sin, didn't come out in North America until its remake on the PSP. It was Persona 3 that truly pushed the series into the popular niche that it's known as today. Nowadays, most people only know the series thanks to the most recent entries, and I include myself in that crowd. Sometime in 2013, I decided to check out the Vita remake of Persona 4 called Persona 4 Golden. Wow, so this is what I'm missing out on. After putting over 80 hours into the game, I decided to check out the older titles in the series and really enjoyed them, especially Eternal Punishment. I played every main RPG in this series, and I always wondered why they didn't try to incorporate or explore some of the older elements, like multiple Persona per character. Thus, making a Persona game more in line with the original might convince people to give Revelations and the older Persona games a try. For that matter, while Persona's greatest strength has always been its writing, the dungeon design in the past two Persona games have been its greatest weakness. Well, that and taking about two hours to actually begin. But as I said before, it's great in concept and in concept alone. Execution-wise, its greatest aspiration is for the Persona elements to try and cover up the fact that this is an entry in Odyssey game and not a throwback to Revelation, complete with map drawing and FOEs. Frankly, the decision to design this game in this manner is as baffling as crossing over Fire Emblem with Shin Megami Tensei, though this one makes substantially less sense. The two have nothing in common outside of being RPGs, and the distinct styles and approach to gameplay of each series couldn't be more opposed to one another. One of the main goals of the original Persona was to create a JRPG that was more friendly towards the North American gaming market, a concept which has remained consistent in each entry. In contrast, Entry and Odyssey is meant to invoke the unforgiving old-school challenge of classic RPGs of the 80s. The two don't blend well together, and sadly, that's a problem that's reflected in the game's design. For starters, the Persona series is known for its varied cast and characters, yet progression in Q requires a devoted party of five in order to progress. If you were expecting to be able to easily swap out party members from one dungeon to the next, think again. Once you get past the second dungeon, it's next to impossible to change your party up without a lot of grinding. Speaking of the dungeons, dungeon design itself was never one of Persona's strong suits, innocent sin and eternal punishment notwithstanding, so one would hope that the ones present in queue would provide a solid landscape to delve into. However, the dungeon design is not particularly strong. They go beyond the realms of being watered down to simply being badly designed. Take this section for example. In this room, there's a treasure chest down a long road with an FOE that chases after you if you look at it. The idea is to grab the item before the FOE catches up to you, but look at the ring's placement. The ring to get out of this place should be closer to the box, if not, right behind the player for them to safely escape. Moving forwards or backwards will cause the FOE to come closer, and since it's all in a straight line, there's no other route to travel, which means you can easily get trapped. If you don't have a go home, which is the only way to exit the dungeon, your only options to get past the FOE are through brute force or to get a game over and start over from your last save point. You can't say there's nowhere for the ring to lead up to if this placement was so close to the treasure box since there's another room right behind that wall. Its placement makes no sense. While the dungeons do provide in the way of variety with their many themes, said variety comes at the cost of the design and difficulty, as none of the puzzles provide any amount of challenge. With the exception of one puzzle, which I had to draw to get a visual for what I was looking for on the map, most of the solutions are very simple and never provide any mental stimulation. In this regard, the third dungeon is the worst offender. In the first few flights, the stairs that lead to the next floor are always hidden behind a locked room, so you have to find the key in order to unlock them. However, the key to the stairs is always found in a room behind another locked door on the other side of the map. This is not good 
Dungeon design. The entire point of this first person approach to dungeon crawling is to place the player in an unexplored environment and have them search through this unfamiliar territory for the entrance to the next floor. The dungeon should be more not sequential than linear. They should encourage them to explore every tile, uncover every secret, find every dead end, every chest and item and so forth in order to continue their progress through the dungeon, not a linear progression of events set in a dungeon. There are treasure chests which unlock when you explore the entirety of a dungeon, but none of the dungeons themselves spark the desire to explore every inch of them to earn said reward. Especially when you can just use play coins to open them instead, or more often than not, wait for the item to become available in the game's store. On top of that, they don't build off one another so much as they present the player with a different set of tools to try out, with none of them holding your attention for very long. The second one features a series of questions about your ideal lover, which, at the very least, leads to some good comedic moments, but doesn't lend itself well to engage in exploration. It's all gimmicks that don't serve any purpose in a dungeon other than to drag out the time spent on each floor. And these dungeons do drag on. Navigating a single floor can take hours. Combine that with the high encounter rate and mindless combat, more on that later, it makes for one of the most boring, tedious dungeon crawlers in years whose monotony is only broken up by the banter between the characters that happens from floor to floor. Even an entry and odyssey staple, the FOE, are more of a gimmicky obstacle than they are threatening. They're an extremely powerful enemy that appears on the map, often with various forms in each dungeon. Initially, they're difficult to beat, but honestly, there's very little reason to battle them outside of certain side quests. The amount of time it takes to defeat one is never compensated with a justifiable reward. Sometimes they'll drop a persona, but they're not exclusively earned just by defeating a specific FOE. You can make the same one yourself or earn them through battles later on. And while we're on the subject of battles, it's really annoying to have nearly beaten a group of enemies only to have an FOE show up and make all that hard work fruitless though that's only until you discover how broken the combat system is, which, again, we'll talk about in a moment. The whole FOE concept makes even less sense here than it did in Etrian Odyssey. It's yet another gimmick that only stretches out the time you'll spend in these dungeons. On top of that, there's a few annoying bugs. See this FOE here? In the fourth dungeon, it's supposed to move in a line whenever you take a step, but for some reason, it's frozen in place and won't return to its original position. This is what I was referring to when I talked about how the glitching Pirate's Curse wasn't a hindrance to the overall experience. If the glitch was permanent and required me to reset the game, then yes, that would be a major oversight away for its part. As it stands, it didn't impede on my progress. It's more curiosity than it was detrimental towards the intended design of the area and has since been patched. This, however, is the complete opposite. It impedes your progress and forces you to restart the area rather than continue on without any major issues affecting the gameplay as a result. You also can't swap party members while in dungeons, despite the characters appearing in dungeons. This, along with a few other moments of the game, creates a disconnect between the narrative and the gameplay. During the opening, Theodore and Elizabeth say they're your guests, but then charge you for services like healing and items? They say it's because of the laws of this universe, but they have no idea what this place is to begin with, the laws and logic that it follows, let alone how to get out, or in fact, if they can get out, nor do they have any reason to collect money or have anything to spend it on in this universe or the Velvet Room. So why would they decide to make things more difficult for the people who are actively trying to help them escape, let alone their guests? If you're going to give narrative reasons for mechanical restrictions, make sure they make sense given the plot, setting, and characters. For example, in the pre-Persona 3 games, there's a fairy named Trish who can heal your party for a ludicrous cost. She was characterized as a greedy fairy who exploited her healing abilities for personal gain and nothing more. Given that context, it made sense for the character to act the way they do, and said characterization informs the gameplay. That healing in a dungeon is possible, but it's going to cost you a lot of money. And that's assuming you couldn't even find her. Outside of these dungeons, there's not much else to do. You can heal yourself and buy better equipment, only the ladder's process is far more tedious. Though the shop will show several items, you can't actually buy them until you sell a certain number of materials that you earn from finding shadows in the dungeons. Once you sell the material, you then have to buy the item for a certain amount of coin, and that's assuming you can even afford to buy new equipment from the money made by selling the materials. It becomes a cycle of sorts, going into a dungeon to fight shadows, to gather materials, to get money, to buy better weapons and heal, to fighting more shadows and gathering more materials for even better equipment. It's so tedious! And that's not even getting into the fact that you can only hold on to 60 items. That might seem like a lot, but since each material and item takes up a slot instead of the usual X item has Y amount, and since each battle usually yields three or more materials, your inventory fills up really fast. Thus, you will have to constantly stop your crawling in the dungeon and return to free up more space for the various items you'll find in them. Watch your inventory. Well, maybe I wouldn't have to worry about item management if you didn't give me such a small amount of inventory to manage in the first place. This is like in Resident Evil 5 where a green herb takes up the same space as an AK-47. And armor takes up a space on your inventory. When equipped. 
Thankfully that doesn't happen here, but that's besides the point. The point is that the game actively punishes you for trying to be prepared. You can also take up side quests from Elizabeth, some of which contain a time limit, though the time limit is a bit of a misnomer. These missions will expire, but only if you don't complete them before you finish the current dungeon, not if you waste several hours trying to complete them. At best, it can help raise some of your weaker units since this is the only way they'll gain experience outside of dungeons, but as I said earlier, once you get past the second dungeon, they'll be too far behind to use without some major grinding. It doesn't help that you only have 5 requests at a time, despite the game often providing more than that amount. So it just ends up wasting even more time than it would if you could just take all the available requests. Speaking of time, there's no calendar system, thankfully, and no social links. The latter is replaced with a stroll system. Though some of the interactions between the characters are amusing, it's ultimately a pointless substitution. Say what you will about social links, they at least add to the gameplay while developing the characters. The stroll system adds nothing to the gameplay and has no effect on the game's narrative. See, this is the main reason why I've never liked the Etrian Odyssey series. They're not a throwback to the past, they're old games made on new systems. Drawing out a map, first person exploration, grid based movement, constantly restocking your supplies, limited item space, high encounter rates, grinding for gold to get better equipment, they encompass all the worst flaws of 80s RPGs without adding any of the improvements made in the past 30 years. The difference is that those games had a reason for their design. The 6502 processor, which was common in a lot of these early machines, or, or even its competitor, the Z80, for example, and they generally could only address in total with their two bytes, uh, two byte uh, uh, word size. You know, you can address you know 64k of, of of address space. Back then, many of the decisions made were due to technological limits and compromises to create engaging gameplay or craft an intriguing plot and characters. Grid-based movement is perhaps the best example of this. Nowadays, organic movement in an RPG is standard, but in the early days of Akalabeth, grid-based movement was a compromise made to allow the player to explore an expansive open world, as open as technology would permit. Had the technology at the time allowed the designers to do so, it's likely they would have utilized organic movement. Storage was incredibly limited, which often meant the text-heavy genre could only detail so much in the in-game universe, often filling the player in on the lore of the game in its manual. Bear in mind, these were games that were often stored on floppy disks that could hold, at most, 720 kilobytes. To put that into perspective, you see this image? The file size for this image is over 800 kilobytes. That's how little space they had to work with. And that generally meant 48k of RAM to store your programs in and 16k of ROM to store the entire operating system in. And by the way, 16k wouldn't even remotely hold one iPhone picture. You know, so in where, uh, in fact, 64K wouldn't either. You know, it's, uh, you know, I, I think a nominal iPhone picture when I send it, even after it's compressed as a JPEG, you know, is two or three megabytes. And so it's, it, it's stunning to think how truly tiny the, these machines were in the sense of address space. As technology improved, so too did the opportunity to innovate a given series and find new venues for engaging storytelling. We see this with series like Ultima, which technically started off with a Calabeth that gradually evolved with each succeeding installment, and Final Fantasy, which became infamous for constantly retooling its gameplay and cast and abandoning certain elements, for better or for worse. There's a reason why Shin Megami Tensei went from this to this. Technology evolved over time, and so too has the genre. For that matter, Persona was a notable departure from previous Megami Tensei outings, as it was more focused on character development and Jungian psychology than it was about exploring humanism or demon hunting. As a series, Entry and Odyssey simply lacked that same level of ambition. Even as a simple throwback to the past, it doesn't come across as a breath of fresh air because it doesn't do anything new or offer anything better than any other dungeon caller before it has achieved. Many of these blasts from the past provided their own spin on the original source material which they paid tribute to. Radiant Historia honored the classic RPGs of old and made great use out of the time travel concept from Chrono Trigger. Breathe the Default, for all its faults, was a love letter to Final Fantasy fans of the 60-bit era. Etri and Odyssey, Persona Q included, play exactly like the outdated games that founded the modern RPG, like Wizards 3 and Ultima, forgetting the fact that one of the things that Ultima happened to be was a driving force of innovation for the genre. Wizards 3, not so much, but at least it refined itself with each new entry. Some would argue that's the appeal of the game. But there's limited appeal to be found in a spin-off to an each JRPG series with such basic mechanics when there are much better RPGs. There were interesting elements in place, but they're all sidelined for creating an experience closer to Etrian Odyssey while masking the experience in a half-hearted Persona paint job rather than combining said elements with the core gameplay of that series. Persona Q attempts to streamline the former series' archaic design, but streamlining isn't the same as improving game design. It still contains the same design choices, most of which are for ill. It's the same problem I had with another dungeon crawler released earlier this year called Demon Gaze. 
what interesting elements that exist are undermined by the core gameplay attempting to be faithful to the titles it's paying homage to. And if there's one thing that the Persona series never started off as, it was derivative. There was a creative spark in the early days of the series that this game is completely devoid of. And just to be clear, not every design choice made in the first few entries were good ideas, but they were creative, constantly tinkering with its gameplay to improve the overall experience. We see this with the many changes made to the Persona series with its first sequel, Persona 2 Innocent Sin, which introduced a third-person camera, a directional movement, and the best combat system in the entire series with fusion spells, a system which was later improved upon in the second installment of the Persona 2 duology. And of course, there's the major changes made to the series in Persona 3. Even if some of the choices in the earlier games haven't aged well, there's a level of respect to be given for a series that constantly innovates itself with each succeeding title. Say what you want about Persona 1's clunky and poorly aged design. It was experimental, it tried new things, and set a good foundation for a series with a lot of interesting ideas at play. One of those ideas being multiple Persona per character that the player could swap out at will. This allowed for a more dynamic use of skills and led to a more interesting combat system. It comes across as a missed opportunity in Persona Q to not only limit each character to a single sub-persona, but to not allow the player to change the party's current sub-persona with the ones in reserve in battle. As it stands, the execution of the sub-persona is what ultimately breaks the game. Which finally brings me to my biggest complaint, the combat. The combat in Persona Q is closest to Persona 3, but with actual control over the party members and a tiny little twist. By hitting an opponent with the attack that the weak to are scoring a critical hit, you can receive a boost which allows you to use a spell or skill at no cost. If an enemy hits you, you lose that boost, but there's a good chance that they'll be knocked down and unable to attack. And no, knocking down all the enemies doesn't trigger an outlawed attack. They simply happen at random along with special solo skills. At first I thought it was something like deal a certain amount of damage to trigger them, then I encountered an FOE, tried to run, and then out of nowhere, Mitsuru asked me if I want to pull off an outlawed attack. There's nothing that triggers them outside of luck. With that in mind, the ideal strategy might seem to be utilizing weaker spells to gain a boost and then unleash powerful ones at no cost, but said strategy pales in comparison to a much more effective tactic. Thanks to the inclusion of sub-personas, the characters will recover a certain amount of SP after every battle. Since you recover these skill points, this means you can easily have your party spam one-hit kill spells like Hama and Mudo to the point of guaranteeing that every enemy will drop dead in a single turn without ever having to worry about SP consumption. This tactic is incredibly effective and works throughout the entire game, even in the final dungeon. Now, obviously, some enemies resist the attack, but they're the exception rather than the rule to an easily broken system that contains a ton of enemies that are weak to these attacks. While the bonus for beating enemies as quick as possible lends itself to lowering what little challenge the game has outside of random status effects or preemptive attacks that the game throws at you. Even if FOEs become more of a nuisance in the later dungeons, an auto battle takes just as long as manual commands. And considering how much of the 60 hour epic will be spent in combat, that is a major problem. And the sad part is that there are glimmers of potential here, like an interesting boss battle with a priest that actually requires strategy in order to defeat it. And the final boss is an epic showdown whose only problem is the same as the ones in Persona 4, in that they take an hour to take them down. It's nice that they included a quick save feature, and the inclusion of a visual indicator for random encounters made things more convenient in spite of the high rate. The best new addition by far though, is the sacrifice spread. Fusion itself is largely the same as your average Megami Tensei title, so the sacrifice spread is a breath of fresh air for what is more of the same. Essentially, you choose two Persona and sacrifice them in order to increase the experience of a third Persona, with those in the same class receiving a bonus. It's a small but useful feature that helps free some slots in your limited roster for new Persona to use and fuse while allowing them to have some use, and the occasional material that actually adds to the core gameplay of collecting and reselling items to get more equipment. The only problem is that you can only sacrifice two at a time, so if your roster is full of Persona that you want to unload for easy XP, you have to do them two at a time over and over again. Did I mention this game is tedious? It's all these little things that show glimmers of potential for a much better and less stressful game. But these small pleasantries can fix a broken mess of a game. And that's a shame because the rest of Persona Q is full of such colorful charm. Now some of you might be wondering about that title. Persona Q Shadow of the Labyrinth. Why Q? Why not just Persona Shadow of the Labyrinth? The answer is simple. The art style used in Persona Q is known as Q version. It's a similar art style to Chibi most commonly found in anime or manga that became popular in the mid 80s. It essentially boils down to taking more serious character designs and changing them into a less realistic rendition. In essence, this game is the Q version of the Persona 3 and 4 universe and it's an adorable one at that. The characters are so cute and incredibly expressive that it makes you wish that there was another game in the series filled with this much charm in its character design. Less charming are the dungeons which, while possessing good aesthetics, do not impress with their low resolution textures. Still, the FOEs look decent enough, the ones who are spotted at the presentation are the Personas themselves. I now understand why they wouldn't want you to see your persona in battle because the artwork is simply dreadful. The animated cutscenes look great, 
but they're few and far between to do anything more than break up the story with some pretty visuals. Not counting the intro, there's only 5 of these scenes in the entire game. Most of the cutscenes use the in-game engine, and though they do look good, it's still disappointing to see them used so sparingly. Kamen lacks any sort of flair from the skills from friend and foe alike, which, again, doesn't make for the most interesting first-person fights. Even the screen-filling all out attacks lack any sort of visual punch to them, and the sound effects for hitting enemies start before the characters even attack. The highlight of Persona Q is Atsushi Katasho's score. It is a supremely catchy collection of new songs and remix material from Persona 3 and 4, and that's without getting into the incredible arranged soundtrack. That said, the songs with lyrics suffer from the same problem that every lyrical accompaniment in Persona does. Bad writing. There's nothing special about that. She's just singing while being on a carousel with a lover. There's nothing clever, there's no twist, it's just them being in love, and it happens to be on a carousel. The lyrics aren't insufferable, but the songs would be vastly more ear pleasing without them. Likewise, the battles could have used more sound effects for different spells and skills, rather than the single one used for practically all of them. Why not? They already recycle a ton of shadow models from the other Persona games, so why stop there? Also, the sound quality during all of the attacks is noticeably worse than usual. Good. Wanna go for an all-out attack? Oh, everyone's really fired up! Our morale is quite high. The voice acting is full of Atlas regulars, and while peers may be sour that they opt to use the voice actors from the more recent Persona games, they all do a great job. Save for Zen. I hid my mistake. Got nowhere to run! The night goes on is oh, Trust me, there's a ton of Rithworthy material in this game. Actually, we say, Chan, it's about ethics in the Velvet Room. <laughs> Too easy. It's all these little things that make me want to like Persona Q. But at the end of the day, the best soundtrack, loveliest visuals, and funniest story can't save the core gameplay from being dull. There were some great ideas here that could have led to a refreshing take on such a tired formula. But execution is the key component that the title fails to achieve. Persona Q is a confused title that doesn't know what it's trying to be. It isn't a throwback to the original Persona since it's missing a lot of elements and ambition found in Revelations, like the three per party member Persona in interesting battle system. It doesn't add anything new to the Persona series and in fact removes many of the tried and true mechanics for a lesser experience while replacing the personality filled cast with mere caricatures. It's not even particularly good at being an Etrian Odyssey game or a dungeon crawler since dungeon design is simple to a fault or filled with gimmicks and the combat is easily exploited. It is a gigantic mess of an RPG. If you're looking for an old school dungeon crawling experience on the 3DS, you're better off with- HA! <laughs> no, Devil Summoner Soul Hackers. At $50, this is one piece of fan service you can safely skip until the price drops or just save it till Persona 5 comes out. Persona Q Shadow of the Labyrinth earns a 4 out of 10. That's all for now folks, until next time, game on my friends. I must not fear. Fear is the mind killer. Fear is the crawling chaos that brings total obliteration. Unless of course 14 years decide to turn back to enter that they never meet, thus steering the entire event of Persona to innocent sin and turning their friend into a mute for the entire next game. Oh, spoiler is for a game that's over a decade old, by the way.